All right, so we're going to start today. We're going to start with um, really covering uh, the, the major architects uh, that introduced modernist and sort of began the modernist movement in Europe um, in the post-World War I era. And uh, then we'll end with a, a sort of a, a project example in which they're all involved, uh, which will make sense in a few minutes. But we're going to start with uh, this gentleman here, Peter Behrens. Here he is. Uh, Behrens um, really uh, was uh, the, the sort of grandfather of German modernism. He was a German architect. Um, you might sort of acquaint him when we were talking about, um, you know, the Chicago School. We were talking about Louis Sullivan being kind of the father. You know, he was influential to Frank Lloyd Wright. He was influential to other architects, some of whom you'll be talking about in your research. Uh, Behrens was kind of like that figure in many ways. He um, a lot of the people that we'll be talking about, Walter Gropius and Le Cluzier and Mies van der Rohe, all worked for Peter Behrens at one time or another, not necessarily all at the same time, um, but um, the, the, the key modernist figures of Europe uh, all worked for this gentleman. And so, um, and he, he would initially started as um, the founder of what was known as the Joischer Work, Workbund, uh, which um, we talk about the, uh, Vienna Werkbund, uh, the Vienna workshop that um, Josef Hoffmann had started kind of moving out of the Viennese secessionist movement. Uh, this, a similar kind of thing was done in Germany, which was this group uh, that really looked at um, creating sort of a modern uh, arts and culture and architecture um, uh, like-minded individuals that either formally worked together or informally got together and swapped ideas and talked about things and did shows and exhibitions. And, um, and the, the idea was that it was uh, incorporating all of the, the arts, not just architecture. And, and so um, we saw textiles and, and furniture and um, industrial arts and, and sculpture and so forth. And so um, this is key because uh, one of his apprentices, Walter Gropius, is going to start an even more famous um, sort of work group here, uh, that which we'll be talking about very briefly. So um, one of per, uh, Barron's um, most influential projects and clients uh, was the German company AEG, which was sort of the equivalent of General Electric. You know, this was the big lighting company, electric power company. Uh, they probably had the you know the monopoly on uh, stringing up power lines and providing electric lighting to German buildings um, in the early part of the 20th century when electricity and electric lighting was was, was really becoming a big thing. And so um, he, you know, this this was a major client of his, and so they were, you know, company. They were expanding rapidly, and so uh, he was charged with doing a number of architectural projects, but also even uh, working with them on some of their graphics and logos and creating sort of an identity for them. What an example here we can see. Uh, but really, the, the 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 key project to talk about was a turbine factory that they had built in uh, 1908, 1909 that Peter Behrens designed. So this is an industrial building and, you know, they made, this is where they made the big, you know, electric turbines uh, to generate power. And so in many ways, this was meant to be a, a, an industrial aesthetic. And we talked a little bit about this when we talked about 19th century industrial architecture that, um, you know, we saw like the machinery hall, you know, exhibition halls at some of the world's fairs uh, and, you know, you know, the, the train sheds of railroad depots uh, were kind of given that industrial aesthetic. They didn't try to hide it and cover it all up like we saw with the head houses of the, the terminal head houses of the train stations or with the, the Saint Genevieve library that we talked about in Paris where they, you know, mostly covered all that up in, you know, a more neoclassical or other styles of architecture. But with factory buildings, there was more, you know, there was more leeway. And per, uh, Barron's designed this one here. This is a historic image of it. Uh, but he, he really began to give this, you know, this idea of a factory building uh, an architectural expression that was true to what it was. Um, and 
this is this is kind of the fundamental this is this is the foundation right here this building this project of modernist architecture in many ways because he's taking something that is a a a machine for making machines, and he's going to create what uh, Le Corbusier would say a, a machine for living. Um, and he's he's creating an aesthetic around in the industrial age, which really by you know the early 20th century has completely exploded and and you know taken over. Um, you know, there's no there's no going back. You know, at this point, and so. What we see here is a number of elements uh, with influence by Frank Lloyd Wright. We see some of the horizontal uh, masonry bands here on the corner, similar to what we were seeing in the last lecture. But he's fully expressing the structural elements, which you can see down the side here, uh, which I'll, I'll show you some details of these, these steel um, columns that uh, provide the framing for the roof. And even on the end, even though there's some brick masonry that we saw, uh, the end down here has these massive uh, window surfaces, uh, and they exist in between these uh, column the side as well, which ironically, it's a, a factory for a lighting company that makes, you know, electricity and lighting, but they still need a lot of windows uh, to, to help illuminate the interiors because electricity even at that time still wasn't quite good enough to just have, a, you know, solid walls and no natural daylight. Here's a... Um, a graphic of promoting the company and they feature the building on their on their logos or in their advertising. Um, it was really thought and considered even at the time it was built uh, a really forward thinking modern building that you know represented the the idea of this company of making you know modern lighting for a modern world and modern life so um, it's really beginning to tie architecture into uh, the, the whole cultural aspect of it. So here's a photo I took um, back in 2009. Um, it, thankfully, it survived the, the Allied bombing of Berlin uh, pretty intact and has uh, been maintained pretty well. And you can see, you know, it has these, it has bricks here, um, but also notice the way he provides a little bit of an architectural design detail to the masonry. He you know, he gives the corners a bit of a curve and he can'ts the wall a little bit. If you look carefully, you can see that the wall, the brick wall is actually angled a little bit. And so this is his way. He's not applying ornamentation, but he's making the building itself more decorative, more, more sculptural. Uh, and that's, that's a key thing to modernist architecture, where they're not artificially applying decoration. They're allowing the building to become decorative in itself. And we saw that with Adolf Luz in our last lecture in the way he was using materials, you know, rich marbles, uh, and the way he organized that to create something very aesthetically pleasing without any use of ornamentation. And, of course, now on the side, we can see uh, these steel columns that really needs a paint job. but um, and we can see how the, the wall is canted. The steel columns are, are straight vertical, uh, but you can see how the, um, the masonry walls and even the glazed walls in between the steel columns are all canted at an angle. And this is a structural um, uh, section here uh, through. And what you can also see, here's the side elevation on the far right. You can see the entire elevation is devoted to glass and glazing. It's, it's you know, other than the ends of the building uh, that we saw, you know, back down here, the side elevation, which is pretty extensive, is a glazed wall. And, you know, that's something that we're going to start talking about more and more, the idea of turning a building into just a complete, you know, we talked about the curtain wall with the Chicago School and how they could apply a lot more glass area. But with, um, modern architecture in the 20th century, uh, they, they take that to an extreme and they're, they're looking to create an all glass building in many ways. But we can also see the structural system in the section here. And it's not unlike the, the sort of that machinery hall, uh, exhibition hall at the Paris exhibition we talked about earlier. Um, it, has a, it has a point connection just down at the bottom. Uh, it has, uh, you know, trusses that kind of come out and create an, an arcing vaulted space that allows a huge open hall for, you know, making these massive turbines. And here's some details of the exterior. You can see the steel structure is completely expressed. There's no hiding it. 
There's no decorating it. Uh, there's no, you know, making it look like uh, Greek columns or anything like that. It's, it's, you know, Barons is saying, hey, I'm going to make the, the, you know, I'm going to be true to the to Sullivan's, you know, form ever follows function, but I'm also going to make it almost decorative. You know, you can see the pattern of the rivets on there. And to, to many modern architects, that sort of thing was, was part of the beauty of the architecture. And of course, again, you can see the fact that the whole wall is glazed. There's, there's just thin steel mullions for the, for the glass, holding the glass. And then I, this is one of my favorite details. Um, you, you see it, just a point connection. You know, there's a solid concrete footing down at the bottom. Embedded in that is, you know, is a steel, you know, element. And here comes the steel column down here. And they just pin it together. You know, part of it's obscured by the, the wall here. But, um, you know, it's just a pinned joint. Uh, and, you know, a structural engineer, you know, would come up with this not anything truly creative from a structural engineering standpoint, but this is one of the first times in a building where that's left exposed and you get to see that. Um, it's, it's a really uh, incredible detail that's been influential to architects ever since. All right, so one of the architects that emerged out of Barron's office was Walter Gropius. And we, we briefly mentioned him. I showed you this photo pre previously. He had submitted in a a proposal to the Tribune Tower competition. Um, here uh, he is standing in front of his rendering for that. It didn't get built, but it, you know, it, it was a pretty, 1922, it was a pretty modern skyscraper, you know. Uh, he, he did incorporate the Chicago window into that, um, into his design as kind of an homage to Chicago architecture, uh, where the Chicago window, you know, came out of, and um, you might want to Refresh your memory on what a Chicago window is for your quiz later. Hint, hint. Uh, so here's another view of him. So he worked under Barron's, and in 1919 he founds uh, uh, his own sort of artist architecture collaborative that he called the Bauhaus, uh, which is translated out of German into building house. And it really was uh, meant to be not just a a collaborative of like-minded individuals, but really an academy, a, a, a design school for artists and architects, industrial designers, textile designers, sculptors, painters, anyone in, involved in the arts and especially in the building arts, uh, photography, um, all that. And it was all meant to be very modern. Um, that that the work that they would do would not be classics, you know, would not be Renaissance inspired or whatever. It would be how can we cr create a an artistic expression for the modern world, the the twentieth century. And the Bauhaus becomes one of the great leaders in promoting that idea. Uh, ultimately, he did, uh, they they started in. Um, uh, one part of Germany, and in 1926, they moved to Dessau, and he designs the building, as I'll show you. Uh, and then uh, in, in the early 1930s, when the Nazis gained power in Germany, they did not look too kindly upon modern art and architecture. They thought it was degenerate, uh, and you know, so they, um, they wound up fleeing. Um, and ultimately, Gropius wound up coming to the United States and became the director of uh, the architecture school at Harvard, um, and s therefore became not just influential because of his founding of the Bauhaus, but also because of his uh, work at Harvard University. So one of his first um, important projects uh, was this um, Fagus shoe factory in Germany in 1911. Uh, he was teamed up with Adolf Meyer, another German architect here. Uh, but um, this is really a, hopefully you can see, a, a, a direct descendant of the AEG turbine factory by Behrens, which obviously Gropius would have been familiar with. I think he probably worked on it uh, in, in uh, Behrens, while he was in Behrens office. And so he, you know, it's not a copy, but you can see the same uh, elements here just reinterpreted in, in um, Gropius's manner. So on the end here, we see brick masonry with horizontal lines. He's not doing the curves. He's not doing the canting. He's got sharp angles here. That's a trademark of um, Gropius and the Bauhaus. Uh, but 
uh, but that same element is there. He, he gets rid of the sort of Dutch gambrel roof uh, and goes just with a strain, f straight flat roof with a parapet, another hallmark of what uh, we would consider to be Bauhaus international style architecture. Uh, but he's have the, the whole long wall of windows along here. Uh, and you can see the columns expressed. Now, in this case, they're almost recessed rather than sort of protruding, as we saw at the AG Turbine Factory. Uh, but the otherwise, this is, you know, a wall of glazing uh, to illuminate the factory within. And so this, again, is his interpretation of what a, uh, a factory building ought to look like. And if these were just factory buildings, you know, maybe nobody would have paid attention. But the whole concept of modernist international style architecture is that this, this doesn't just need to be left for factory buildings, uh, industrial architecture. It could be architecture for anything, as we shall soon see. So here's a nice historic photo of it. Um, this building also, thankfully, largely survived Allied bombing. Uh, we'll see examples uh, today that didn't, but you can also see, interesting, look at the corner, go back here briefly, uh, you can even see the staircase inside. You know, everything is, you know, because it's a glass wall, everything is revealed. You know, there's really, it's just a big open plan. Um, and, you know, something like the staircase is on display here uh, through the windows. This is, you know, again, the idea of expressing the entire systems and structure and functionality of a building is a hallmark of Bauhaus architecture. So here we see Bauhaus, and again, this means building house. Um, if you take a literal interpretation, it's basically, um, you know, how to build buildings. And so it was founded in Weimar in 1919, uh, but in 1925, it's moved to Dessau because um, the politics in Weimar were getting a little hot um, in, you know, by 19, even by the mid 1920s, as Germany was undergoing a, unfortunate radical transformation towards uh, fascism. Um, and it really um, became a major player in not just in Germany, but many European architects who were interested in a modern aesthetic, you know, either came and studied at the Bauhaus or followed, you know, it what was being produced there, the exhibitions and so forth, catalogs, magazines, uh, very closely as, you know, to get ideas so here's a the manifesto as uh, created by Gropius, you know, forging all forms of art into a single whole to bring to bringing back together all artistic disciplines, sculpture, painting, arts and crafts, manual trades, and making them integral components of a new art of building. And we saw that a lot, you know, especially in the arts and crafts movement, the idea of, of a holistic, immersive uh, architecture that included furniture, that included um, decorative arts, you know, paintings or murals on walls and, you know, the sculpture that we saw by Richard Bach at uh, Wright's studio. Um, that, you know, this is not a brand new concept, um, but the Bauhaus really takes it and says, you know, embraces that idea that that architecture isn't just about creating, you know, a structure and walls of a building and then, you know, the client does whatever they want with it. That that true modern art and architecture is an integrated discipline. Um, I'm, I'm not I'm going to skip over this a little bit, but, you know, if you're interested, you can see a little bit about some of the um, the studies and classes and things that um, the Bauhaus did, um, you know, people came there. If you wanted to be a painter, you focused on painting and all that, you know, you weren't necessarily taking classes and courses on, you know, photography or something like that. But but it allowed you an exposure to other artisans that were working um, in other in other fields that were like minded. And it was, a you know, an incredibly creative center, you know, artists thrive, right, of being around other creative types that, you know, can inspire them, even if they're doing something completely different. And we can see um, a little bit of a timeline here, um, as we'll talk, we'll be talking about Mies van der Rohe a little later, he actually takes over as director in 1930, um, but has to dissolve the Bauhaus in 1932, after Hitler takes control um, of the government and begins a crackdown on anything that he thought was, you know, Bolshevik, um, you know, Jewish, um, uh, you know, 
degenerate, you know, anything he considered to be that. Um, so um, the, the Bauhaus was was considered to be one of those things. And so um, ultimately, uh, Mies would also flee to the United States. But the key thing, you know, architecturally speaking, that comes out of the Bauhaus is in many ways the building that, um, the school building and housing building that Gropius designs when it moves to Dessau in 1925. So the, the complex is completed in 1926. This is in Eastern Germany. Um, I, I first visited this, just a quick little story. I, I first visited this in uh, 1991. The wall had only just come down like two years before that, the Berlin Wall. And this was in what had been East Germany, the, the Soviet uh, satellite. And it was not even easy to get there from Berlin. Um, you know, I took this train that was ancient <laughs> and there were holes in the floor. You could literally see the, you know, the tracks going by. And if you needed to use the, the toilet, um, it was just a hole in the floor. <laughs> um, and, you, you know, it got there. And I mean, it was, you know, just a sad, horrible place, the city of Dassau at that time, because it had been under rule for decades. And, um, you know, I was shocked. We came to a railroad crossing and uh, there was a little little bell that rang and this guy, come, this old man who can barely stand straight, you know, comes out of this little hut and he cranks down the 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 gates for the for the train you know crossing and about five minutes later <laughs> a train goes by and then he cranks the gate back open and I was just fascinated I was with my friend and we were just like oh my god this is a whole nother world so it, I'm sure it's not anything like that anymore now you know several decades on but um you know it gives you a sense of things but so anyway back to the Bauhaus so here we see um you know, what is really the, f the first pure expression of Bauhaus architecture, um, stripped of all ornamentation, um, you know, geometric massing, uh, flat roofs, lots of windows and glazing, a, an expression of the structure, um, and, but still seeing some elements of Frank Lloyd Wright. Like if you look at this plan here, uh, or this isometric um, rendering of it, you'll notice it's not just a big box. It sort of spirals out like a pinwheel. And if you remember when we talked about Frank Lloyd Wright's architecture um, and his, his floor plans for his houses, many of them are in what people call a pinwheel design. There's a sort of a central hub at the center, and then there's wings that sort of spread out from that. So, you know, this is this is almost directly right out of, you know, Frank Lloyd Wright's Vosmuth portfolio um, of Gropius looking at the plans. Uh, here is a, an actual floor plan of it. And the different wings are used for different elements. There's the, the school classrooms and laboratories. There's administrative offices. There's a wing for housing. And so, and they're connected, you know, by walkways and bridges, you know, not unlike the campus of Triton, right? Um, which is a modernist, you know, international style uh, campus uh, from several decades later. But it's, you know, this is the root of, of the planning for the Triton campus even. And so here is, you know, a project we didn't talk about, but this is the Darwin Martin House in Buffalo, one of his uh, most important uh, projects from 1905. And you can see an aerial view of it, and you can see the Vosmuth portfolio plan of it, and it's the same thing. It's, you know, it's wings that stretch out with walkways and breezeways that connect the different elements. Uh, you know, there's the main house, there's the garden house, there's the servants' quarters, you know, and... Um, you know, Gropius, we know Gropius saw this. I mean, uh, he and Mies talked about looking at the Vosmuth portfolio while they were in Barron's office. Peter Barron's had a copy of it and, you know, they could flip through this thing. And so they were clearly influenced by his, by Wright's planning elements. So here's some more views of the boss. So it's very similar to the AEG turbine factory and to the Paga shoe factory. This is using stucco instead of brick. Um, they would kind of get away more from brick um, in many cases, or m many of the international style architects. Uh, they like the clean, smooth aesthetic of stucco or concrete, uh, you know, if you go even further down. Uh, but yet, you look at down the side here, you know, a glazed wall, just like we were seeing in those two earlier projects. Uh, but this isn't a factory building. It's a, it's a classroom building. It's a, it's a, you know, it's a school. Uh, and so we start to see the industrial aesthetic being applied to other types of architecture.
And here is the, um, the student housing wing. Uh, this has a little less glazing, uh, but the, the balconies sort of stick out and are expressed so that you can get a little bit of fresh air. Uh, but he kind of bands windows together in each, uh, in each uh, little apartment. Uh, you know, again, similar maybe to the way the Frank Lloyd Wright was doing, not using art glass here, uh, but you can, you know, get a, a large amount of glass and glazing uh, to let lots of li uh, light into these apartments. Here's a historic view of one of the um, studios or laboratory spaces, you know, so they could do different um, types of uh, artistry in here. Which, you know, and the, and the idea here is it's a, a raw industrial aesthetic. It's plain concrete columns. Uh, there's some, you know, electric lights hanging down. Uh, there's probably just a plain floor. I mean, there's nothing fancy. It has not been gussied up with, you know, mosaic tiles and, you know, floral decorations or classical, you know, ornamentations or anything. Everything is stripped down to its basic essentials. This is uh, Walter Gropius's own personal office here as it's been restored. Uh, we can see some of the furniture that was coming out of the Bauhaus. Uh, there were quite a few furniture designers that became quite famous. Uh, and we noticed there's a lot of bold primary colors. This is something that um, surprises people that when they think of international style architecture, they think black and white. And in many ways in the United States, that's the aesthetic that became popular because all of the images from the magazines and publications that were coming out of the Bauhaus in Europe uh, were black and white at the time. They didn't have a lot of color phot photography that was being published back then in the 20s and 30s. And so, you know, they thought, oh, it's all black and white. It wasn't. And so it was actually quite colorful, as we shall see. Much the same way we, we misinterpreted uh, Greek architecture, right? You know, we think of these, you know, stark white temples when in fact they were very brightly boldly painted just like we're seeing here. Uh, so here's just a few quick examples of some of the um, uh, different art traits that came out. This is a graphic design, uh, you know, hiding an, an exhibition in Weimar, um, you know, before they moved to Dessau, uh, a Bauhaus exhibition. Here is one of the famous uh, furniture designers, Marcel Brewer. Uh, and one of his famous, these are the nesting tables uh, that um, come out of it. Again, bold primary colors. Uh, Vasily Kandinsky, very famous modernist painter. Um, um, uh, in his bold primary colors, you know, no, uh, no classical uh, Renaissance art here. Uh, Mies van der Rohe was very influenced and uh, inspired by the work of Kandinsky uh, and tried to create space and planning the way uh, Kandins in three dimensions, the way Kandinsky was doing in two dimensions in his artwork. Uh, Laszlo Mahalinagi uh, was a photographer and head up, headed up the photography department. Um, this is one of his photographic prints here. He would later also immigrate to Chicago and founded the um, uh, art, art Design Institute, um, I'm forgetting the exact name now, but it actually, it started with the School of the Art Institute and is now affiliated with IIT, ironically, because Mies and Nagy did not get along well together. Elsie Mogelin, this is um, a textile art that she did um, that was on display at Elmhurst Art Museum a couple of years ago. They had a great exhibition on, on the Bauhaus. I don't know if any of you had a chance to go see that. Um, this was all pre-pandemic, um, but it was a really nicely done exhibition. So this is some of her work. Uh, this is a great photo I like to show. Um, you know, they, they got to have fun. They were students, right? They got to have fun. This was their idea of, of fun. They would design their own costumes in, of course, a very uh, modernist aesthetic, you know. And um, this is, almost looks like kind of a um, space age B-movie, you know, alien planet, you know, alien from Mars, you know, invading the, um, the, the earthlings or something, but um, pretty wild. There were actually a couple of the costumes were on display at that exhibition at the Elmhurst Museum. All right, so let's talk about Le Corbusier. Um, he was another architect that emerged out of Peter Barron's office. He was not affiliated with the Bauhaus, um, but he had the same aesthetic that Walter Gropius had and was teaching at the Bauhaus. Uh, here he is standing uh, with his distinctive glasses and standing with one of his most important uh, commissions. 
Uh, here he is with his uh, thick round glasses that became a, a trademark. Uh, his actual name was Charles Edouard Generet. Uh, he was a uh, Swiss French, um, but he, uh, he sort of took the name Le Corbusier. Uh, and of course, many people just call him Corbu. So, you know, if you're asked to identify him on a quiz or test, um, it's okay to say Corbusier. Uh, and I'll probably give you credit for saying Corbu as well. Um, it's a little easier to spell, I suppose. Um, you don't have to give his formal name because that's not really what he went by. Um, he um, trained not only under Barons, but he worked with uh, an architect, uh, Auguste Perret, who worked a lot in concrete, uh, much the same way Frank Lloyd Wright was experimenting in concrete in the United States in Chicago and Oak Park. Um, Perret was experimenting with concrete in Paris at the time. And so um, he would really focus a lot on concrete uh, later in his career. Uh, his first project that, of note, um, it wasn't even a real project in many ways. It was a kind of idealized house. You know, if uh, somebody might have asked him, you know, if you were to design a house in this, in this, with these ideas, this, you know, this, you know, uh, industrial sort of architecture, uh, what would it be? And and he came up with what he called the Domino House uh, from 1914. And the idea here was to really strip down a, a house into its basic essentials, you know, floors, columns, you know, roofs, uh, foundation of some kind, and then the rest of it almost didn't matter. You could apply the facade, you could apply the rooms and stuff inside whatever way you needed to for that individual family, but at its core, uh, a, a house was this essential basic structure that he called Domino House. And here's an, uh, a rendering, an actual rendering that was on display at an exhibition on um, Corbusier a couple of years ago at um, the Tato Ando Museum in the, on the north side of Chicago. Anyway, um, out of this, he develops what he called the five points of architecture. And um, if you're taking notes, uh, this would be key. Um, to know and understand what these five points are, because it becomes kind of a modernist international style aesthetic um, that you know spreads beyond just um, uh, Le Corbusier. Uh, number one are the pilotis, and the pilotis are the way that the building sits on the ground. Rather than just sitting flat on the ground, um, he wants to raise a building up off the ground. And you can see them here, they're not dramatic, but here you see these little uh, little piers that the first level is sitting on, those are the pilotis. And um, the idea is to raise the building up off the ground. A second is a roof garden. Uh, we don't exactly see it here, but on the top is a flat roof. And if you have a flat roof, you could do something with it, right? You can have outdoor space on that roof, a balcony or a garden or whatever, uh, and that should be utilized. And it's a way to provide a natural uh, outdoor space for the residents. Um, number three are the partitions. These would be the interior walls that are not shown here, uh, but they're not shown because they're not dependent on the structure. They are independent, they're free flowing. You can move the walls and organize them in any way you need. Again, an idea that Frank Lloyd Wright had, which of course he borrowed from the Japanese, Soji screens. Um, and so Kabu takes that to heart and says, look, the interior, if you create a structural system that is independent, your interior partitions can be free to do whatever you need to do. Uh, number four, the idea of horizontal windows or banded ribbon windows. Again, something borrowed from Frank Lloyd Wright. Um, uh, again, not seen here because your facade can be anything it needs to be because your structural system is independent. Um, again, the idea from the Chicago School of a curtain wall. Um, and that's number five as well as the facade. It's independent of the structural system. And because it's independent of the structural system, the windows can also do what they need to do. Uh, and they can be flexible just the way your partitions are flexible. So understand what those five points uh, are because they are going to be pretty consistent throughout the international and modernist architecture, even if not always literally interpreted. All right, so how does those play out? Um, when he finally gets a real client to work with um, in 1928 uh, at, with the Villa Savoy uh, in Poissy, France, which is a suburb just outside of Paris. 
the Savoy family were, you know, wealthy family, and they wanted a country house. Um, this sits on a hilltop on a bluff overlooking the Seine River, uh, which at that time was a beautiful vista. It's since been, you know, uh, more industrialized, and there's a lot of, you know, views of factories and uh, all that now. Uh, but at the time, this was a great sort of semi-rural retreat uh, where they could, you know, get away from, you know, crowded industrial Paris and, you know, have some time out in the country here. And so he creates a building that is essentially the Dominio house uh, with all of those five principles. Um, most clearly, we can see right away, right, are the pilotis these structural columns that raise the main level of the house up off the ground. There's still a core down here at the bottom, but the, the house essentially is lifted up off the ground. Uh, we can see the ribbon windows, right, going to stretching out across here. We can see the free flow, you know, form of the facade. On this uh, right elevation, we have some windows and we have some openings. Uh, the openings are into roof gardens, in this case on the first level, but we can also see some elements of the roof garden on the upper level as well. So all the, L all the five points are on display here. Uh, here are some of the plans, the, the floor plan, uh, the ground floor plan is over here on the left, you can see the little dots. These are the pillow tees. And this is the structural the grid, um, which allows right the, the rest of the ground floor walls to be a circular and curved and do what they need to do completely independent of this group structural grid. Uh, and then on the second and uh, upper floor, we can see some roof gardens and we can see a plan that sort of meanders and does what it needs to do independent of the structural grid. So here's another view. This is kind of looking at it from the street view. Um, uh, and so uh, the Savoys would have, you know, they were wealthy enough to have a driver. So they would come out, you know, the driver would take them in underneath the, um, underneath the building here. They would be let off under this shelter and they would walk into the front door and then they would go up a stair or a ramp up to the main living level. So here is the view um, that they would have experienced. They would be dropped off here. This is the front door not exactly, you know, screaming out, you know, it's the way Frank Lloyd Wright also didn't, you know, highlight his front doors. Uh, but you also see just a glazed wall. Um, we're taking that glazed wall we saw in those industrial buildings by Barons and by Gropius, and we're applying that now to a, to a house. So uh, we're seeing this transformation from industrial architecture to any kind of architecture. And here's the ramps that are inside. Uh, uh, I'm not a big fan of Corbu personally, but I do love his sculptural elements. Um, and, you know, it, it, a lot of his work is, is sculptural. Uh, and he was really an artist by training. Um, uh, and so you see that reflected in much of his work here. So here's some of the views of the ramps that carry up. There's the roof garden on the right. And we see the ramp that leads you up to yet the upper level deck of the roof garden here, walking up this ramp to this upper deck garden area here. And he sort of has this sculptural garden walls up here on the top with a window that sort of frames the view down into the river valley. And then this is the, the glazing that separates the living room from this initial uh, roof garden and you can see it's all glass i mean you know by the 1920s you know we have glazing technology allows us to have huge plate glass windows and so that's what he's putting in here um uh th you know this would have been common in you know again factory buildings or commercial buildings he's doing this in a residential building and the view from the interior of this we can see the columns are completely independent of of the walls of the partition. So we're seeing how his concept of having an independent structural system can allow this free flowing of partitions and of extra uh, facades. I love this bathroom. This is a famous view of this tiled bathroom with this kind of chaise lounge or whatever that you can dip in the tub and then you can, you know, you know, have a rest, you know, outside the tub uh, afterwards, I guess. 
All right, so another project that comes a little bit later but kind of shows the evolution of his work is the Unité de Habitation. This is um, just after World War II ends in uh, Marseille, France, down in the south of France. And here is a historic view of it. Here he, uh, he's working in concrete. Um, uh, the um, uh, Via Savoy is mostly in stucco, clad in stucco, but this is all uh, cast concrete, uh, much the same way, right? We talked, we saw one of the first concrete buildings in Unity Temple. Now we're seeing how that evolves in really just about 50 years later. Um, but we still see the same elements. Um, the building is set on pilotis. They're not the thin columns we saw at Via Savoy, but it lifts the building up off the ground. Uh, we see, you know, bands of windows. We see free-formed facades. And as we'll see shortly, there is a roof deck as well. And he's very much inspired by the the industrial aesthetic of Midwestern American grain elevators. Uh, he saw these in books, and he just loved the idea of this, uh, you know, on the Great Plains, you know. And um, really, again, and not a literal interpretation, but this is really an interpretation of a Midwest American grain elevator. And he was very direct about that influence. So here is a modern view of it. Um, again, you can see when not in black and white, you can see that there are still bold colors introduced here into, um, into the, uh, the gardens or the balconies that each apartment has. Here is the roof deck. So there's a pool, there's, you know, kind of clubhouse. He takes sculptural elements for big chimney flues. Um, so he's, you know, incorporating that element of his five points into uh, this apartment complex. This is a section that kind of shows some creative uh, planning elements here. He actually has duplex apartments here, uh, which kind of interlock. The, the yellow here is the, the, the central corridor that exists on every third floor, which you know helps keep down the, the wasted um, space of, you know, of non-rentable corridor actually and so you would come in in this apartment in the purple apartment you would come in at an upper level and then you know there's space in your apartment down below in the white apartment you would come in at the lower level and you could walk up the flight of stairs to bedrooms and so forth that are on the upper floor and then uh the the, the two stories is the living room which provides a, a bigger open uh space uh for for the residents here's the pilotis um, and this uh, this type of concrete would be known as beton brut, um, uh, which is what the term brutalist architecture devolves or evolves from. Um, and it, it's not meant to be like brutal in a negative way, although many people interpret it that way, but rather from the French beton brut, um, which is exposing and expressing the forms of the concrete. Um, again, not applying ornament, but allowing the the board form uh, elements to be, ex you know, exposed when you take the forms off and it, to at least Corbusier, it was beautiful. This is his modular man. You know, you can compare this to Leonardo da Vinci's um, Renaissance man. Um, he, he thought he could design buildings uh, based on this, these proportions. Um, one of the reasons I'm not fond of Corbusier is because these proportions suck. <laughs> they are not realistic and his spaces are not comfortable to be in, in my personal opinion. Here's, uh, this is not someone I know, uh, this is just grabbed off the internet, someone standing next to, uh, to the impressed form here of, of his uh, form. You can see his figures aren't exactly very realistic here. All right, so one other thing that, uh, um, Corbu does, uh, this is earlier in 1925, he comes up with this scheme of how to reimagine cities and how to address housing shortages and uh, slums and tenement housing and so forth. And he uses Paris as his example. Uh, he called it his plan voisin uh, for Paris, his vision plan for Paris in 1925. And it was just a, it was just an idea. This was not a real project for him, uh, but he envisioned the idea of taking central Paris bulldozing it and building these apartment buildings in gardens. Um, and while never implemented in Paris, thank God, um, 
it was implemented in the United States, as we'll talk about in a later lecture with the urban renewal of the post-war World War II generation. But this is the model he created. Here's the Ile de la Cité with, you know, Notre Dame. He thankfully decided he would leave that and he, would, he left the Louvre, which is over here in the bottom uh, left corner. Uh, but the rest of the right bank gets demolished in his plan and these tall apartment buildings in gardens are, are constructed um, that would be served by automobiles and all of that. Um, you know, again, a, a pretty forward thinking idea, you know, other than the destruction of Paris, um, because this is what especially American cities would, would sort of use as their inspiration in many ways. All right, and lastly, I want to talk about Mies van der Rohe. Uh, Mies is with his famous um, uh, Crown Hall model, which we'll be talking about in a later lecture. Uh, lecture. Uh, Mies is another German architect, again, came out of Peter Barron's studio. Um, he had admired neoclassical architecture. He loved the work of Frederick Karl Frederick Schinkel, which we talked about in the neoclassical um, uh, lecture, uh, but he did not want to copy that. You know, he was inspired by the, the, the planning and the, the order and symmetry of it, but he did not want to create an architecture of the past. He wanted to create an architecture of, you know, the zeitgeist, you know, the, the architecture of now. Uh, and of course, his famous quote is less is more. Uh, he had um, another great quote, which was um, almost nothing. He wanted to create an architecture that was, quote, almost nothing. He was stripping it down to just its bare essentials, the way these other architects were doing as well. He also developed a concept that we'll talk later about, uh, which is known as universal design. It's, a, it's sort of a play on what um, uh, Corbu was doing with the sort of free-formed partitions uh, in which, you know, you, you have fl universal flexibility uh, with an independent structural system. And he would flee the Nazis uh, in the late 30s and settle in Chicago and became the design director and architect for the new Illinois Institute of Technology on the south side of Chicago. This was one of his early projects, again, completely um, fantasy. Uh, in 1921, a, um, a building site in Berlin uh, for an office building, and he envisioned an all glass skyscraper. Uh, the rendering in many ways is, is doesn't you know really reflect the idea that this is all glass but he thought hey you know why why have exterior terracotta or masonry or other elements why not just have pure glazing on the outside of, of office buildings um, completely radical idea in 1921 nobody even knew how to do something like this the the technology for sealants and all that didn't exist at this time uh, but 50 years later um, this this is what would become the, the trend, you know, the common use for, for office buildings. Uh, one of his first really important early works is the uh, German pavilion known as the Barcelona, Barcelona Pavilion um, during the World's Fair in Barcelona of 1929. He collaborated with his um, uh, uh, design partner, Lily Reich, at that time. And this is a historic view of it. This was just meant as a temporary building to um, uh, really as a place where the, the king and queen of, of Germany would be received when they visited the fair. Uh, and that others could, you know, visit, you know, act out, you know, modern design and, and elements of, of a new modern Germany, uh, which ironically is about to be transformed, you know, in a couple of more years by the Nazis. It was then dismantled after the fair ended, uh, but in the 1980s, it was actually rebuilt. And so the photos I have of it, um, uh, the modern photos of it, are of the reconstruction, which was pretty faithfully done, actually. So this is a very simple, this is not a complex building, um, but the planning is all Miesian. Um, He's influenced by the sort of free-flowing plans of Frank Lloyd Wright. He is... Uh, influenced by the sort of flexibility of plan uh, of Corbu's Domino House um, from earlier. And so this is his interpretation of how to, to make all that work. And you see that he's got an independent structural grid. The little dots are the columns. And then he has walls and partitions that aren't even solid, right? They're, they don't even close a room into a square or a rectangle. They just sort of 
define a space, loosely or roughly define a space, much the way Wright was doing in his prairie style houses. And if we look at the Ro oops, not Roney House, <laughs> I got to correct that spelling, Roby House in Chicago, his great masterpiece, he's doing that same thing. He's just using this um, solid uh, stair and the, and the fireplace as, and even the ingle nook element as a kind of way to loosely define the spaces of the living room and dining room. And, the, and the, even the wings and pavilions of the building sort of slide into and past each other, much the same way that Mies does at the Barcelona Pavilion. And so here we see uh, some modern views of the reconstructed pavilion. Um, he uses really rich marbles here um, and stainless steel for the columns. And that's the way he ornaments this building. He's not applying any kind of ornamentation to it. Uh, he's just using very nice materials that provide an aesthetic quality. And I love this photo because uh, you can see these simple partitions that just loosely define spaces. They are not enclosed rooms uh, with four walls and a door. And you can see, of course, how the, the stainless steel columns are completely independent of any of the walls. So in many ways, this is like almost a pure domino house. It's not sitting up on pilotis the way Prabhu would have it, but it's, you know, it's, you know, these floor and roof slabs with these, you know, point columns and then just slabs in between defining, roughly defining the interiors. So here, this beautiful marble wall we see, and then we see a raised wall looking into a little uh, light court with a reflecting pond and a sculptural element. One of my most favorite sculptures, actually. Just a few views. Oh, and a famous Barcelona chair. Um, you know, you're, these are common in you know almost any office building lobby nowadays, and and in many office uh, waiting rooms and so forth. Uh, this these were designed by Mies and Lili Reich uh, to be the chairs for the king and queen to sit in. Uh, these were chairs for royalty, uh, so keep that in mind. I know, yeah, uh, Joman, this this is 1929. It's incredibly modern. Very very. Uh, um, you know, very, very modern. If this was built in the 80s, you wouldn't, you wouldn't question that. Um, uh, and in, in fact, many ways, this, this is the inspiration for architecture uh, for the rest of the 20th century. I love this view here. I love how you can see that that sculpture is really the main element in this pavilion. And you can see her from almost any angle. You know, Mies just, you know, obviously placing the sculpture in the way they did, but also the, the views and the, the way that Mies arranged this space so that you almost always have a vista to her. All right, so um, he also did a famous house um, early on in his career. You know, none of these guys had much work in the 1920s. You know, Germany uh, and that part of the Europe was in a horrible economic depression, which is partly what allowed the, the Nazis to rise and the fascists to rise to power. Um, so, you know, it's not until the late 20s, early 30s, ironically, before many of these early modernist architects in Germany get much work that they can actually build. Um, but, you know, the most famous uh, by Mies is the Tugendat House in Brno, Czech Republic. Um, at that time, Czechoslovakia. Brno was a real industrial city. It was almost like the Chicago of uh, Eastern Europe. Uh, a lot of wealthy industrialists who uh, were interested in art and culture, uh, and they had the means to pay for it, much the way, same way that many of Chicago's industrialists and businessmen um, had the means to, you know, buy impressionist art and to hire crazy architects like Louis Sullivan or Frank Lloyd Wright to design buildings. And so this is Mises' interpretation of these principles, Bauhaus and Corbus, you know, five-point principles. Uh, again, he doesn't he doesn't have the pilotis the way um, Corbusier does. His you know is a solid wall, uh, but he has live you know multiple levels of living. He has roof decks. He has bands of windows. You know, plain unadorned stucco facades here. All of those elements that are a hallmark or trademark of the international style. 
here's a view of it. I got to see this before it was restored uh, in the in the 20 teens. Um, so some of my photos, um, I'd like to get back and see how how much better it looks now. But you can see again the same way that. Um, uh, Corbu did uh, these huge plate glass windows at the Via Savoy. Mies does, you know, massive walls of windows. The entire facade of this uh, of this wall that looks out over the landscape uh, is just plate glass windows, as we can see really clearly from here. Um, and this sits dramatically up on a hilltop overlooking the city. So here's uh, one of his columns. So the the structure again is a is a grid of columns um, that allows the, the exterior walls and the interior partitions to be completely free form. This is the view from the street, a little, you know, unimpressive in many ways, but, um, you know, the, the primary facade is on the back side, which has this great view uh, into the, the, the valley beyond. This is the entry, this is a historic photo. So you come in and you see this glazed wall with a curvature that sort of draws you in to the front door, uh, hiding the front door a little bit, just the same way Frank Lloyd Wright would do. And then the floor plan, you can really see how this grid of structural columns allows a free form partitioned interior. So here you can see the dots with the columns, and then he can do this circular curved wall, this little slab wall over here, another curved wall. Again, this is his interpretation of a Kandinsky painting that we saw uh, a few slides ago when we were talking about the Bauhaus. All these just different weird lines and angles and curves and circles on a, on a canvas. Here he's doing it three-dimensionally in a building. It's, it's just an incredible uh, accomplishment here at the Kugendab. And some of my photos uh, from my tour, again, before it was restored, but still in pretty good shape, uh, this, the stainless steel columns the, or the, and, uh, and this incredible onyx marble wall here. This is just the slab defining a partition between the living room and the uh, office, which is in behind there. And here you can see it's just a thin slab of marble. That's it. It's not even it's not even attached to a solid wall. It's it's attached at the floor. It's attached at the ceiling, and it's just a thin slab. That's that's a, you know going almost nothing as as Mies would say. You know taking it down to just the bare essentials. And here is the curved wall. Um, this is actually this is this was restored later. This is sort of a faux wood here. Um, they they did put in um, uh, a new veneer uh, to match the original. Um, this house got pretty abused after the uh, you know Nazis took over. And um, uh, in fact, the two uh, the Tugendots were were Jewish, and I think they were able to flee successfully, or most of them. But um, you know. <laughs> The house was obviously taken over, um, given the fact that they were Jewish. Um, so here, um, it's just an incredible, you know, woodwork in here, a round circular table that, you know, fits into that space. The the Bruno chairs, uh, another famous Miesian design that he did for this house here that is replicated now, you know, in office buildings, you know, throughout. And here are the windows that, you know, are plate glass windows that completely slide down into pockets into the basement. Uh, I actually got to see the mechanism of this working. It's just this chain hoisting system, you know, on a motor that, you know, slides the window down, slides the window back up. And, and so you can, you know, if, if Frank Lloyd Wright really wanted to break down the walls and barriers between nature outside and the, and you know, human living inside, you know, this is the next step in that. All right, and lastly, before we take our quiz, I want to talk about uh, what's known as the Weissenhofsiedlung. Uh, this is in Stuttgart, Germany from 1927. Um, if you were in grad school, you would have to know how to spell this and not using cheating with notes or whatever, okay? Um, so just to give you a sense of what it takes to, to you know, become an architectural historian, uh, I will not make you spell this from, from scratch. You might have to identify it from a list, but, uh, uh, and, you know, tr even trying to pronounce it if you, if, I'm not, I don't speak German very well, but I have learned to pronounce a Weissenhofsiedlung. It's one of my favorite names. So the Weissenhofsiedlung was a, 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 
organized by the Deutsche Werkbund as a housing exhibition. And Mies van der Rohe became the, the sort of central planner for it. And the idea was Stuttgart wanted in the 1920s, they said, hey, we, you know, we have this housing problem uh, and we want to showcase um, modern forms of housing and open it up to the public. And then when the exhibition is over, we will rent out the apartments and housing, you know, so people can live in this. And so they, the idea was it should be very modern and not, you know, some replication of the past. And so Mies uh, invited all of the important architects working not just in Germany, but across Europe to participate in this. And so this is like a collection of the greatest European art, 20th century architects in one place. It's, it's like the Columbian Exposition of, uh, of Germany, except the Columbian Exposition was meant to be temporary and was in fact on afterwards and all we have are photos, but the Weissenhofsiedlung was meant to be permanent. Sadly, some of it was bombed out during the war, but many of the buildings do still survive. And you can still visit some of these as museums uh, and others are still used as housing for people to live in. So here's a, a graphic of all the different architects, some of whom we've talked about, Le Corbusier, Walter Gropius, um, uh, where is, here's Mies van der Rohe, Bruno Taut, um, Peter Behrens was invited, uh, a few others that we uh, didn't talk about that are very important. Uh, Ludwig Hilbersheimer would actually come to Mies to IIT uh, with him in the 1930s as well. So here is the apartment block that Peter Behrens designs. Uh, by this time, he's fully immersed in the international style, Baja style, you know, um, as well. Uh, his own interpretation, uh, you know, plain stucco walls, flat roofs, parapets, uh, not so much banded windows. He does more punched windows, but he does have this sort of open uh, um, little balcony, inset balcony here. Walter Gropius, unfortunately, his house was, or the house he designed was destroyed and never rebuilt. Uh, but this is his, um, his Bauhaus style building uh, incorporated. This was meant to be more of a single family home. Uh, this is the apartment block that Mies van der Rohe designed for the complex. So again, we see many of the same principles that we had talked about applied here. Uh, also very similar to Adolf Luce, you know, some of those designs we saw Luce doing back in the, um, in the teens and 20s as well. And uh, the comp or the duplex by Le Corbusier, uh, this is, um, you know, two apartments basically uh, side by side. You can see the dividing wall right here uh, featuring the five points. Here are the pilotis. Here is the main level level with a band of windows. And up on top, you can just sort of make out a roof deck. And I love this photo. I love historic photos of this architecture because it looks so modern, so contemporary. And yet it's built in a day when you had, you know, uh, fast cars and fast women or something like that. Or, you know, here's the flapper girl and, you know, and this roadster, you know, high speed car that probably, you know, was stretching it to get up to about 40 miles an hour uh, on the brick and cobblestone streets. But, um, you know, I, I really love the, the contrast between this is what was modern when this building was built. And the entrance uh, to uh, the complex here. So you come up here, the pilotis on the right, and you would come up into this doorway. And then you rise up to the main living level. Here's the floor plans. I'll skip over these a little bit to get onto. Um, bold, bright colors, interiors, just like we saw with other international style architecture, this sort of sculptural staircase that we see in this image here. And a floor plan that was very flexible, um, so flexible that um, Kabu's concept was that you would, there was no bedroom and living room and dining room. They were all one. And your bed would be pushed under into a cabinet at, in the morning, and this would become your living room. And then in the evening, you would open up the cabinet, you slide the bed out, and now it's your bedroom. Uh, he thought that, you know, the, the space could be just completely flexible. Yeah, kind of like a Murphy bed. Yeah, exactly, Jomon. Um, you know, this one's more you slide it in and out rather than sort of fold it down. Um, so just like a studio apartment, you know, from this era and even exists today, um, that, that kind of concept. 
and you can see the free and let's go back you can see the the, the columns it completely independent right so that you know you have a full flexible interior and partitions here's a, another view of this um, sort of bed concept or whatever sort of partially slid out they're just trying to show you this is a museum space so these are my photos from that and here's a historic view so here are the beds pulled out you know right now it's a bedroom you know but you'd slide the beds back in and during the day it's your living room and the other room becomes the dining room um this was so radical that as soon as the exhibition was over in order to rent the apartments the the city of stuttgart completely remodeled this <laughs> and and put in regular bedrooms and regular living rooms because nobody wanted to you know the average person did not want to live like this and so um you know this all what we were just showing you was a complete reconstruction of the interior based on the original plans and, and photographs but um, you know that it was too radical for people in the 1920s and 30s and here's a view of the roof garden uh, with a nice view over the valley uh, in the central city of Stuttgart um, and you know this also representing one of the five points of Cabo's architecture so that is the early work of you know European modernists. And this is going to be incredibly influential in our next lecture talking about modernism and the modernist movement in the United States and how that develops.